We're in Saka, in the heart of Siberia, where the population density is around one person per square kilometer. The region is made up of immense spaces, occasionally intersected by interminable roads. But also by gas pipelines that run faithfully beside them. Filming them close up is forbidden. This one has been dubbed the power of Siberia. 3,000 kilometers long, the pipeline runs southwards to the town of Blagoveshchensk before crossing the Chinese border, where it provides power for the country's industry. As Russian journalists and photographers, we've come to meet the inhabitants of this region, thousands of kilometers from Moscow. Gennady is one of the people who live near this gas motorway. But like most people here, he doesn't benefit from this natural resource or the money it generates. Far from the big cities, daily life is much as it used to be. The only sign of modernity is this road used to transport the goods required for gas exploitation. Today, doing our job as journalists could land us in prison. We have to remain anonymous and, most importantly, move on quickly to avoid arousing suspicion. Zoya came here in the 1980s, hoping to participate in the biggest infrastructure project in the history of the Soviet Union as a railway worker. At the time, the communist government had decided to break the region's isolation by building an immense railway line, attracting Soviets from all over the empire. Salaries were higher than elsewhere. Zoya likes to reflect on this idealized past. What are your memories of that time? Со всех концов столько национальностей было. И мы ели, пили с одной чашки. Да, всех поддерживали. Мы никогда двери не замыкали. У нас все было общее. Не то, что мы сейчас даже соседям не знаем. Zoya arrived at the age of 25 and never left. She now works as a nursery school assistant. She's made a life for herself here in this remote corner of Siberia, which inhabitants gradually left after the fall of the Soviet Union. Like the local inhabitants, the nursery school has never benefited from the region's natural resources. It is now a mere shadow of its former self. How many children are there here? No, когда я пришла в Осетистаром, было 116, а сейчас 35. Do you use gas heating? Why not gas? Not gas? Do they promise to supply gas? There is a gas pipe near your house. Aren't people getting upset? They are selling to China, but there's nothing left for us. Here, as with elsewhere in Russia, we've learned not to get involved in politics, not to denounce injustice, 
not to benefit from the gas and the mountains of money it funnels into the pockets of a few at the expense of everyone else. Even the road, despite having been taken care of by a regime always keen to make the most of its natural resources, seems to be suffering in places from a crying lack of resources. To get from one village to the next, people sometimes have to travel hundreds of kilometers. A little way off the road is Kadyu and Timancha's house. They are Revinks who belong to a small indigenous community on the verge of dying out. Having been marginalized during the Soviet era, Siberia's ethnic groups have seen their lands ravaged by mining operations. <laughs> Is the village getting richer because of the gold nearby? What do you generally do in the village? <laughs> Drink to forget. Drink to stop thinking and crying. Accept a life of basic comfort without complaining. Are everyone's toilets outside? Isn't it cold? Since the war in Ukraine, the volume of gas passing through the power of Siberia pipeline has increased by 66%. But the region remains one of Russia's poorest. Here, we are far away from dreams of power. This village, for example, like others, after experiencing a gold rush in the 1980s, has gradually been deserted by its inhabitants. Today, it's a ghost town, swallowed up and reclaimed by the forest. We clock up the kilometers, sometimes without encountering a soul. As if there were anything to celebrate, newlyweds appear out of nowhere to take photographs featuring smoke in Russia's colors, white, blue, and red. <coughs> Next stop, Sivaki, population 1,200. It's far from everything and has practically nothing. The nearest hospital is a three hours drive away. Maria, a former factory worker, is worried about the number of young people from the village who have left for Ukraine. У меня у самой внук там на Украине на этой. Зачем нужна эта? Я говорю, сейчас вот эта война, когда она кончится или нет? И чем она кончится? Начинает вот новости. Вот сколько этих как боевиков погибло, а про наших молчат. 
А по телевизору не говорят, как будто не погибают наши. Наши та же. У нас в Сиваках уже, наверное, трех. Двое. Двое похоронили. Посуду беру. Мыть вынесу на улицу. Ну вот, под поле. Полная картошка забита. Ну там темно, свету нету. Ну вот так угу. бабушка и живет. For Maria and Tatiana, the conflict in Ukraine is close by and far away at the same time. Even though it's happening thousands of kilometers from here, they're affected by more than just the death toll. Наверное, еще будет хуже. Я говорю, а что же, это же расход идет. Расход, деньги же нужны. Помощь собирали. Ну и у нас в подсовете собирали их той. Russia has just announced that its military expenditure will increase by 70% in 2024, 6% of GDP and 30% of federal spending. Against this backdrop, people like Maria and Tatiana living in Siberia won't be able to count on public funds to help lift them out of poverty. But everywhere, including in cities, Russians remain fatalistic. The village of Yukta has a tragic history. For years, it centralized local administration of Stalinist labor camps. Today, 500 people live here, including Valentina. Now in her retirement, Valentina paints paintings that mix religion and propaganda. Внутренний враг, внешний враг. Европа, Америка, вот это все враги наши. И я их вот так выразила. Вот, вот так. She lives in a little house made of wood with her 30-year-old son. She can just about get by on her pension, which is barely 200 euros per month. In winter, she heats her home with wood. Like everyone else living here, she isn't connected to a gas network. Between 1930 and 1960, up to 120,000 prisoners lived here, including the famous writer Solzhenitsyn. All that remains of this sinister past are a few ruins. Много расстрелянных здесь людей. То есть даже село находится фактически на останках этих людей. Мы ходили на речку купаться. И мы детьми находили останки человеческих ну, частей. Там, ну, черепа, кости, там, рук, ног. В общем, конечности человека. Ну, это, собственно, страшно. Ну, да, называли врагами народа. Ну, какие же они враги, если так вдуматься? Это были герои. Да, они были не согласны с политикой Сталина. Поэтому это были образованные, умные, грамотные люди. В большинстве своем. And do you think that happens today? People become enemies for political reasons. But Valentina has other things to worry about, like the nearby gas plant that has taken over the majority of discussions. Tucked away behind the forest, it's considered a strategic site and is therefore heavily guarded. But the locals don't feel reassured in the slightest. Газпромом в связи с тем, что он в опасной близости от села, 
Но пять раз взрывался завод, и мы это видели. Взрывалась труба огромным стол, столбом пламени ввысь. Собственно, мы видели это и ощущали взрывы на себе. Ну, вот так. Думали, что будут расселять, но никто нас не расселяет. Слухи ходят всякие, например, такой, что, возможно, даже сами вымрете. Вот, и, ну, в общем, за жизнь, за нашу никто не, не борется. We're not far from the Chinese border. Traffic conditions have improved, perhaps a sign of regular exchange with Russia's powerful neighbor. This year, Chinese exports to Russia rose by 75%. Here, hidden in the forest, is the Svobodny-21 base. It's a former Russian army nuclear base. Until five years ago, it didn't even appear on maps. The base has become a children's playground. It isn't far from their parents' flats. They play here among the rubble and equipment, abandoned by the army. Back then, the base had all the modern comforts of home, unlike today. There was a swimming pool, shops, medical infrastructure, public administration. Now the people living here have nothing. Anastasia and her family have nowhere else to go, so they stay, even though they know that the radiation levels are abnormally high. Люди сильно болеют, которые работали вот здесь, уже поумирали рак. Do you get help if it's that dangerous to live here? Да, ну чтобы какую помощь давали. Когда раньше приезжали землянеры, они говорили, радиация вообще в Амурской области большая, надо говорит по 100 грамм пить и по яблоку есть. The fatalism of our fellow citizens never ceases to amaze us, but nothing surprises Tatiana, Anastasia's daughter. Ну жизнь тут так-то нормально, только для детей площадок нормальных нету. Они стоянты этот выиграли, а нам его не дали. Дали миллион и то забрали. I don't understand. Why did they take it back? Ну, сказали, сейчас идет война на Украине, и поэтому у нас площадки по гаммис не стоят. Лариса used to work as a cook at the base. She is worried about the future, especially the war in Ukraine. У нас вот мальчишка, ну и все, собрался и поехал добровольцем, как бы. Мы он месяца там не пробыл. Просто сидели в казарме, их там что-то 300 лишним человек. Вот. Ну, это уже по разговору, когда это... Ну и что, дрон? И все. Месиво. Привезли в коробочки. Only the elderly and children remain here now. Many young people have been called up. Only a few, like Semyon, are lucky enough to stay in their homes. But for how long? У нас пацаны служили, служили на СВО, погибли, ну, мои товарищи. И я пошел в церковь, я поставил свечку за упокой, чтобы э, их помянуть и, и еще душевно себя настроить, потому что меня это тоже ждет, мы потому что... Находимся в том же котле, варимся, неизвестно, что будет завтра. Нас могут послать туда как на помощь. И я еще просил о здравии, чтобы настроиться душевно. Потому что на одном, на одном эго или как на одном 
патриотизме. Патриотизм — это же наша вера, это же наша страна, вера в будущее, в возможности в свои, в, свой, в свою семью. The Russian Orthodox Church has been an invaluable supporter of the war effort since the start of the conflict, at the cost of many lives. Officially, the government recognizes the deaths of 6,000 soldiers. Unofficially, the figure is at least 10 times higher. All along the road, towns and villages are reporting casualties. Lots of young people attracted by money and adventure have signed up. Many have never returned. We are in Blagoveschensk, the largest town on the pipeline route. Around 240,000 people live here. As a result of Western sanctions, the pipes of the power of Siberia now connect to the Chinese network just across the way, on the other side of the Amur River. Sergei, an electrician living in the city, believes that this new route taken by the gas is partly to thank for current good relations between Russia and China. But this hasn't always been the case. Ну, прямо вот за Дуни тут маленько побаивались. Китай это, потому что он огрызался тут. Территориальные претензии же он предъявлял. Мао Цзэдун. Ну, а потом все это образовалось, утихло. Они тоже пошли, как говорится, на эту, на рыночную экономику. Китай тоже стал на рельсы рыночной экономики. Ну, Собственно, что делить-то, я не, не знаю. Ну, сейчас дружба. A friendship many locals see as natural. They appreciate China's support for their country since the war in Ukraine. Мы уже полностью отказались же от Европы. Все же мы с западными странами ни с кем и не сотрудничаем. Мы же полностью перешли на Азию. Но оно и должно быть так, потому что мы же потомки с Банго татарского ига, все равно мы же, у нас все равно татарская кровь бегит так какая-то там. Поэтому нам ближе Азия и по понятиям, и по крови. Our journey ends here, far from Europe and Ukraine, in a Russia that wants to look the other way and not worry about the consequences of war. <laughs>